Free from the irrelevant. Free from the irrelevant. What does irrelevant mean? Basically, this is from the dictionary, not relevant. Or, <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah. Uh, or not applicable or pertinent, or it doesn't pertain to me. It doesn't, it, it doesn't affect me. It, does, it, it has no validity to me. Irrelevant. It does not, it does not pertain to me. Because if we're going to be free, there are certain things we must understand that the enemy will throw at us that do not pertain to us if we're going to be free. John, um, Jesus said this in John 8, chapter 8. He said, and you will know the truth and what? The truth will set you free. A little further down, he says, so if the son has what? Set you free. You are what? You are sometimes free, never. You are guaranteed to be free. That's what indeed means. You are guaranteed to be free. And see, some people, even in our faith, will say, oh, but that's not true, brother. You know what? I mean, I've, I, I, I still struggle with these things. He said you are free so long as you are willing to allow the Son to set you free. That's the stipulation. That's the requirement. Being in church is not what sets us free. It's receiving the son who is the center of this house that sets us free. That's why when we, when we had that moment, if we've had that moment, we took that time and we prayed and we said, Jesus, I accept you into my life. You may, ha you may have actually had that, that word or that opportunity, those words come out of your mouth, but did you really, did you really take it to the point to where you said, Jesus, I need you to set me free in that. You may have not said the words, but you, that's what you meant. Set me free because what I'm living right now is not what I want, is not what I need, is not what's really helping me. Does that make any sense? You getting where, where I'm going with this? So today, the point of this message is basically this, that you know that you, you are or you can be absolutely, undeniably free. That you know that you are or you can be, in case you're not, in case you're watching online, you know, the opportunity is there for you to know that you are undeniably and absolutely free. You are, but you have to, you have to step into your freedom. So let me pray and just kind of gather our minds and be ready. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to, to worship in your presence, Father God. There's no greater moment that we can have but to be just in your presence, Father God, and we know your presence is here right now, Father God. And so I pray right now, Father, that this word would fall in the right place, oh, Father God, in every heart, that you would speak into our lives, that you would show us exactly what it is you are saying to each one of us this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen? Amen. amen. So I... My, the verse that I, I, I was referencing this morning had to do with James, the, with James, what he said in James chapter 1, actually. And he starts out that actual chapter. This is kind of a preface, right, uh, before the, the actual main verse that I want to focus on. But he starts out telling them in, in verse 2, When troubles of any kind your way, uh, come your way, consider it an opportunity of great joy. Question would arise, because he's speaking to the 12 tribes, right? This is who he's... he's, he's He's speaking to a, a diverse amount of, peop, uh, of people in different areas. And this is his letter. And he's saying, when, when things happen, when bad things happen, know that it's an opportunity for great joy. And that's not exactly what you want to hear sometimes <laughs> when you know you're going through some stuff. So the people would be wondering. But he gives them the actual understanding of it in verse 3. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. If you want to have a chance to grow, you're going to have to allow yourself to be tested. And it's not always going to be fun. 
Because one of the points last week was freedom is not easy. Stop thinking that everything is easy and start realizing that there is some work to it. But the result that you get is eternal. Not always easy to swallow, right? But he starts, that's how he starts. A little further down is where I want to focus on today. James speaks in verse 22, chapter 1. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law or the word of God that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Then God will bless you for doing it. But you have to remember what it says. You have to even declare what it says. See, there, there, there's, there are certain situations where people say sometimes, no, declarations are, are I mean, that's, that's too ritual-like. It's not ritual-like when you're declaring the living word of God. Because the living word of God continues to flow. It has life. It's not the same boring statement over and over, unless that's how you're saying it. Why does the ball always fall on my, on my court? Why can't the ball fall on their court? I don't want the responsibility. Don't tell me that it's the way I say it. I'm just going to read it, and it should do its work for itself. Really? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It's our responsibility to declare it with the understanding that God wrote it, and if he said it, it's going to happen. If he said it, it means something. It doesn't mean something because Gus said it, ever. It means something because God said it, and because he said it, I will say it, and I'll share it with you, right? So the definition prior to, I think a lot of us fall into uh, before the last verse, it says, you see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. How many times have we fallen into that category by definition of the word of God? You know, we've known the word, we grew up in the word, we read the word, we heard the word, but we even saw it and then we walked away and we didn't. The moment of trial came, the difficult moment came, and we stepped away forgetting even what we looked like, according to the example here. It's... It's normal. It, it happens. What God is saying is, don't let it happen. Do your part to make sure it doesn't happen. Because it's that critical that in your moment of need, you must know how to defend that freedom that he gave you. Because he said the perfect law or the word of God that sets you free is what you need to remember you need to look into. Look into the Word of God. Study the Word of God. At the very least, read the Word of God. A verse, whatever it is, take that moment so you don't forget your freedom. But if you're going to defend your freedom, you need to know that when the enemy of your soul speaks lies, God's living Word causes that spirit of fear to become irrelevant. When the enemy of your soul speaks lies, God's living word causes that spirit of fear to become irrelevant. What do you mean? The moment you understand what the word of God says about fear, it's irrelevant to you. 
but guess I'm always scared. I, I, I'm scared of horror movies. I'm scared of the dark. I have to sleep with a nightlight. It goes beyond those little, little things. But you got to start somewhere, right? Know that fear is irrelevant the moment, the moment you realize the power of the living word. That's really what it is. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear and timidity, but power, love, and self-discipline. Power, power is power, is strength, is what you need, even just to get up from your chair and go to the restroom if you have to right now. Even just to pick up your phone or, the, or, or write something down on, on the, you know, uh, message guide that you have, that takes some amount of strength. You can't sit there, look at it, and hope that that pen starts writing or that, you know, your, your little uh, letters on your phone start typing stuff out. It takes some um, amount of effort or power. But God's telling you, you have a greater power because he hasn't given you a spirit of fear. And so when you understand that fear is irrelevant, then you understand that believing in God's power is what will get you out of that fear. Fear cannot hold you back from living your purpose. Fear cannot stop you from declaring what you can't see. Or it should not. It can't. But how many a times has it done that? How many times does fear hold us back from sometimes sharing the love of God with somebody in action and in word? And I'm one of the ones that will always tell you, I'm not asking anyone to do anything I, wouldn't, I would not myself say in the sense of I don't, I don't know you know, a hundred scriptures to quote a person to be able to share the love of God in word with them. But I do know what God has done in me, and I do know a few verses that will probably be a little put together, but it's maybe the GIV or whatever, the Gus International Version. You know, I don't know. But it, it will get the point of cross to understand that the, the, that the most inspiring thing I can do for somebody else is to overcome my fear and tell them how I overcame that fear. And fear isn't even the topic. I'm just saying, what did God do for me? Why, why did I walk out of my blindness? Why did I walk out of the fear of, 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 of not knowing the tomorrow and saying, God, I trust you. I can't do that anymore. I can't do this anymore. Why? Even looking forward to eternity, a nice way of saying death. Do you look forward to death? The average person does not, you know, the majority, let's just say, not the average, the majority of people do not like death. It's a normal, natural, you know, an understanding that we, we just, oh, death, mm -mm. it's just it's our normal tendency to fear death. But the spiritual side, the moment Jesus Christ sets in your heart, guess what? Death is no longer a fear. Death no longer has its sting. The word of God itself quotes it that way. Death, where is your sting? Meaning death, where is, what is supposed to be so scary about this? But it only happens when Jesus has set himself in your life. When you've accepted the fact that you need, you need the one and only that can give you eternal life. And not eternal life in doom, eternal life in, in heaven. You have, to, you have to understand that. So Romans 6.23 talks about the wages of sin is death, but it has that second part that kind of gives us the the reward to it, right? The, the, the best part of that. But the free gift of God is eternal life through who? 
through Jesus Christ. The free gift of God, free. Remember we're talking about free from the irrelevant? The enemy will tell you, no, you're not free. No, you're, 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 you, I already had you. You said that right, Satan. You already had me. And you couldn't do what God is doing now in me. That's the mentality you got to have. You, you, we need to have that mentality. Yes, you had me. All of us, the enemy had us at one point till we said, Jesus, come into my life. Yeah, sometimes it's, that's exactly how you got to say it. Because I know in some of the most difficult moments, whether, whether we're in the car, my wife has had to say it, you know, I mean, I'm trying to figure out what's going on and I'm trying to swerve. But she says the name of Jesus and something happens. Because you cannot say the name of Jesus and have nothing happen. It says, the word of God says that at the name of Jesus, the enemy has to flee. He doesn't have an option. He doesn't have to think about it and say, maybe he didn't really mean it. The name of Jesus has that much authority. It, it does. It really does. And sometimes we come to the house of God and some of our fear is getting into God's presence. Experiencing the Holy Spirit. And even letting God wrap his arms around us and experience his love. And I get it. There are moments in our lives that we've gone through that we, the last thing we just, maybe even when we, before we came to Jesus Christ and gave our lives, the last thing we wanted to hear was something that had to do with anything that we, in our mind, thought was religious was about this God that I don't know where he's been because he hasn't been with me. I, look at what I went through. Look, who, look what they did to me. Look what they, because the enemy will give you a mentality of a victim at every moment he can. Even when you accept Jesus Christ. Guess what he's trying to do to you? Even sometimes when we step in this house, he's trying to, oh, she didn't even say hi. Oh, hmm. Well, he thinks he can sit there. That's, they know that's always my chair. I'm the victim. I'm the victim. I'm the victim. When you got to step out of the fear and, and understand that the fear is irrelevant when God's living word is spoken. And it's been spoken. And it continues to be spoken. But it's up to us. Don't fear God's presence when you come into this house. Because maybe I should warn you that the presence of God will continue to get stronger in this house. We've passed that one year mark. And I'm not making any, I'm not saying anything in regards to that. It was just a big hurdle. It was. It still is to a certain degree. But we've passed that. And if I were to hear Pastor Rudy say something, he would say, now move. Pick up your head and move. I didn't allow myself to be the coordinator of something that God wanted to do just so that you could sit back and just keep moping. Allow the presence of God. Allow the Holy Spirit. If you were feeling something itchy, kind of like, this feels odd. Maybe I need to even step out during the worship. It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit is in this place. And it will not get any less. It's going to get stronger. And it's not a warning. It's almost like an advisory that, hey, you, you need the Holy Spirit. You're in the right place. You know someone who needs the Holy Spirit? Bring them here. You don't have the right words to even in, tell them even about the love of God. You, you're thinking, I can't even share my testimony. Just bring them. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. If, 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 it, if, if you're stuck at that point, you know what? That should never keep you from bringing someone to experience the power of God. God's living word causes that spirit of lack to become irrelevant. Lack. Psalms 34.10 says, even 
Strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. The first part, strong young lions. What that means is sometimes even those who you think are the strongest, even those you think that have the most money, even those you think that have it all set in place and everything is in the right little place, even they will go hungry. Even they will have a need. Unless, unless they are the ones that decide to trust in God so that they will never lack a thing. See, my bank account doesn't determine whether I have lacked a thing. Your bank account does not determine that. Your employer, your business does not determine whether you lack no good thing. God determines, and he promised it. He said it, now believe it. Get over the fear because it's irrelevant. Get over the lack because I'm not this poor little person. In God, it don't matter whether I live in 78207, which I grew up in, or I live in 78207. 209, which is, I think, Alamo Heights, or I don't know. It don't matter. I loved living in 78207, the poorest zip code in the city for many years, and I grew up there very happy. Never thought about whether well, I'm scared to go out of my house. I went, I came back at 11 o'clock at night, I walked. Never bothered me a bit. Maybe it was mom's prayers, I don't know. Nobody came out and jabbed me with a knife. Because now I understand it was him watching over me at all times. And I lacked no good thing. I didn't go without meals. I didn't go without a shirt on my back. I, didn't. I lacked no good thing. I did not lack any good thing. Right? Right? So stop doubting his provision. Trust him that your tithes and your offerings matter. Not to Freedom Life Center. It does matter. Trust me, it matters to Freedom Life Center. But it matters more to God. And people will say, Gus, you're getting into a sticky area. Get out of it. I don't get out of it because I live it. And I don't have to tell you numbers. And I don't have, all I know is that somehow tithe never goes undone. Offerings are always made. And every payment always gets paid. I don't, I don't depend necessarily on a name of an employer or um, of my own business. I depend that God said I would lack no good thing. And no matter what. I will, and I declare that lack is irrelevant in my life. Will you, will you do that? Will you declare fear is irrelevant? Will you declare lack is irrelevant? The enemy right now is in the news. On the news, you hear a lot about, oh, well, there's gas prices and there's inflation, and you go to the grocery store, and yes, it is real. The prices are high. I ain't going to lie, you know? I mean, I tell my wife, she laughs at me. I'm down to the great value, some of the stuff that, if you know what great value is, great value is the store brand on some of the stuff, because I'm like, it tastes the same to me, and it's a snack, it's a, I'm good with it, I'm good with it. But the, the idea is, you know what, it's okay. God always provides, whether it's great value or it's name brand, it don't matter, he's going to provide. But the enemy's putting, oh, there's a recession coming. Everything's happening because of recession. It, but my God says, I am your provider. He said that in Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply all my needs, not some of my needs, not just a partial or some, some, some idea of those needs. Every one of those needs is going to be met. That's Philippians 4.19. That's Paul writing. Paul not, not writing based on his on a third party's understanding, but on a personal understanding of what God had done in his life. And maybe you thought, and you said that house prices are going crazy, and this, that. you know what, and cars, and, 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 and I, I can't even move in my career, because if I move, well, what if that doesn't work out, and all, you know what, 
First of all, again, fear is irrelevant, and God said that he would not let you lack. He will supply with everything for you. And so if you were planning to, to you know, buy that home, why not? Why should you say, be wise about things, maybe re-evaluate, re-evaluate and maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll save a little more or I'll find some... You know, whatever it is, but don't let the enemy put brakes on you and say, oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. You lose your freedom when you allow him to do that. You're, not, you're no longer free. You become a slave to that mentality of, well, what if? There will be what if moments, but the idea, the idea is understand that your what if moments are overcome by the word the living word of God that says, I am and I will supply everything you need. Even when we have to understand that his living word also causes sickness to become irrelevant. Sickness. We just heard a little bit of something. Pa- Pastor Patsy mentioned something in regards to, to, you know, when we're feeling sick. You know, maybe there's someone sick. You know, Brother Art is feeling sick. And on a side note, I always do this for him because I think he, he deserves, he's a man that deserves some honor. He served 33 years fighting fires for San Antonio. And the fire that he's fighting right now has to do with that. His health. Because he walked in when others had to walk out. The reason I say that is because we need to understand that there, there are moments where we're going to have to do something for somebody else and others will be walking out on them, but you're going to have to walk in on them and say, I'll be there for you. I heard you were sick. I'll pray for you. You don't have to be calling Pastor Patsy. Uh, what time can you meet us? Because you know what? Take authority. You pray for him. But I don't, know, I don't know all the words, Pastor. She's not practicing at home the biggest words she can pray for you. When I pray for someone, they probably think, gosh, this guy prays so elementary. Well, it doesn't matter. When I believe in a living God, I don't need the biggest words. I need the largest faith is what I need. And so when I pray for somebody, I, you know, again... I pray the way I'd want to hear someone pray for me. Because I, again, I don't need the largest words. I really need someone to pray for me that has the largest faith. So that I can be encouraged in my faith. So sickness becomes irrelevant. Psalms chapter 41 says that he sustains us in our sickbed and our illness. And in our illness, he restores us to full health. In our illness, he'll restore us to full health. He sustains us. Not necessarily a medication or a medical plan. He sustains us. Even in our sickbed, he'll sustain us. Speak out against the illnesses. What speak out means is I will pray against it because it is irrelevant when the word of God already told me that Jesus, by his blood, he took care of that. By his blood, he took care of that. Psalms 147 says that he heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. I have often heard that verse. He heals the brokenhearted. A lot of that has to do with with. Sometimes the mental or even the physical or relational health that we're seeking help from. But it says in the second part, he bandages. Why does he bandage their wounds? Why would you bandage someone's wound? I'm speaking to a nurse. Why? I'm speaking to a nurse. Awesome to have, you know, professionals in the house, you know. But why? Because there's, there's a moment that healing that has to happen, so you bandage it. In other words, they don't just get up to the, to, the, to the patient and all of a sudden, just because they did what they did, they put a little medication and now it's gone. You bandage it 
Because there's a process to the healing. So when God starts that process to the healing, he bandages our wounds. This whole year has been a big bandage to our womb. It still hurts, but it's still healing. It hasn't stopped and started, oh, my gosh, now they're going to have to cut off my leg. You know what would have been cut off the legs? We would have been announcing, you know what, uh, Freedom Life, we're going to have to move. Um, they are going to lend us this little house over here, or we're going to open up at Pat Pastor Patsy's house because uh, we just can't keep up. Amen. Yet three weeks ago, we celebrated what we actually got to really celebrate um, on Good Friday, which was the signing over of this building to us. I say to us because you are Freedom Life Center. This belongs to you. Go again. Your offerings, your tithes. That's why they are important. Because they make this happen. And so the bandage is there. But guess what? Slowly they'll start removing the bandage. And, and God's healing takes place. And if you're going through something, you need to understand that your sickness is irrelevant when the word of God comes into play. The moment God wrote it, he meant it. He didn't write it so that mm, sometimes it's going to be irrelevant to them. Go ahead. It's relevant at all times. That is the word of God. That is, what he, that, what, that is what he designed to write in this word so that we would understand that everything the enemy speaks to us is irrelevant. He, the enemy will never speak something that's relevant to you. Do you did you believe that? Do you understand that? I get caught up in that because I, I lived sometimes part of my life thinking sometimes maybe he's right. Maybe I'm not that. Maybe I can't do that. Maybe I... Everything the devil says is irrelevant. But it's up to us to realize what is relevant. The word of God is relevant. And the last thing, God's living word causes that spirit of judgment to become irrelevant. Judgment. I put this at the end for a reason. Romans 8 says, There is no, therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of sin, who, who loves sin? Satan loves sin. Who wants permanent death for you? Satan. Because the word of God promises eternal life through Jesus Christ. But the word of the enemy, the only thing he can promise you is eternal death. Yet we must remember that the first part of this, ver this verse says, therefore there, is, <clears throat> um, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who accept Jesus Christ. See, anything said against you is invalid. It don't matter what your past was like. It don't matter what, what, the, 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 what the history book says on you. Because some of us may have a book. You know, people are all, rem oh, I remember the time he did this, and I remember the time he did that. Oh, and I remember that. They have a book. And, and then when they see you, they're like, man, remember that in chapter 2? Sometimes it's that defined, and all they're looking is for the little things they can pick on you. And, the enemy, and the, the enemy just tries to throw more stuff at you. But the word of God says that all of that is irrelevant, and none of that is valid. The moment you step into a relationship with Jesus Christ, all that becomes invalid, unvaluable. And what does God say about it? God says that you're new. Where does he say that? Where does he say that? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, again, in Christ, he is a new creation. He's not a creation. He's not another creation. He is 
new. He's a new creation. Amen. I love the second part of that. All things have, gone, have passed away. Behold, all things are, have become new. All things have become new. You are not that same person that they were think, thinking of. So God says that you're new. God says that you're valuable. Amen. He says your past brings him glory. When others say your past brings you down, your past, man, you're the worst of the worst. God says, no. He's my son. She's my daughter. They bring me glory. Because of what they went through, that brings me glory. Because look where they're at now. Not where they were, but where they're at now. That's where it matters. That's where you matter. You're in the house of God. You may say, oh, just came it's a nice thing to do no it's not just a nice thing to do it's better than that because God has greater plans for you than that he wouldn't bring you into this house knowing or into any house around San Antonio a house of God he would not bring you into the house of God if he didn't have the greater plans he already drew up for you he wouldn't why would any God do that he's not here to waste your time he's here to give you what you were already purposed to have. So if you're a new creation, everything else doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether your friends are, are, are talking about you. It doesn't matter whether your own relatives are talking about you. It doesn't matter whether the people just kind of look at you. It don't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's all irrelevant. Because the enemy has no authority over what God has done in me, what God has done in you, ever. Don't give him that authority. Don't lose your freedom. Defend it. The moment the enemy starts to mess with you, defend it. The moment he starts to put fear in you, defend it. The moment he starts saying, you don't have enough. You think you'll ever get out of this? You think you'll ever own a home? You think you'll ever own a, uh, your own car? You think you'll ever be able to walk, drive off a, a lot knowing I'm okay? I, you know, the payment's going to be okay? Uh, don't fall into that fear. Don't fall into that lack. It's irrelevant. And I'm here to tell you that if you're free, all of that is irrelevant. If you're seeking freedom, I have the solution for you. It's Jesus Christ. And through that, you will get all that that is irrelevant out of you and be all of a sudden, all that is relevant of what God already spoke about you and for you is placed at your feet. He would put it at my feet. Yes, he would put it at your feet. He loves you that much that he would actually do as he did to his own servants, his disciples, kneel down. Wash your feet. Place the word and say, you're mine. There's, there's some, I guess sometimes we overlook how much the love of God was through Jesus Christ that he, uh, he did those things, and we overlook. We know that he, he washed the feet, and we read through the verse, but do you sit, sometimes sit back and realize what he actually had to do to do that? And all he was doing was just saying, I'm just setting the example. Could we, even if it's more as just an example, would we be willing to serve someone at that level. Because the world will say, he stooped down to that level. No, he stepped up to that level. When you're willing to do something like that, you're stepping up. You're not stepping down. And because you're a new creation, you're able to do that. 
So how do we do that? How do we, how do we maintain this freedom, especially on a daily basis? Well, easy peasy. Really. Don't get serious on me. Smile. God loves you. I love you too. <laughs> we maintain our freedom daily by consuming his word. Consuming his word. See, because I can look at this word. I can just read the word. And even if I had to demonstrate it to you, kind of lick the word, you know, I could... You know, but it's until I consume the word that it makes a difference. See, because many of us at some point, because we didn't want to consume the word just yet, that's where fears came back. That's where the irrelevant thoughts came back. Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, they say these things about me. Oh, I'll never get better. Oh, no, she's, she's on her deathbed. There ain't, there ain't no turning that around. Did you lick the word or did you consume the word? <laughs> consume the word. For the word of God is living and active. That's Hebrews 4.12. The, the word of God is living and active. At the end of that verse, it says, it, it's discerning the thoughts and intentions of a heart. It it will bring out what your true intentions and your thoughts are when you digest the word. It's going to reveal things to you. And I remember I told you the quote a little earlier that what the truth sets you free, but it sometimes ticks you off. It's going to make you a little uncomfortable sometimes. But guess what? In the, un in the discomfort, there is comfort. Seeking his plan. You cannot seek if you don't take some action. You cannot. I can't dig into or hope that whatever's in the ground, it will come up somehow without me doing my part to dig. I have to seek his plan. And the last thing, we maintain our freedom daily by surrendering to his Holy Spirit. Oh, there's that Holy Spirit again. Don't fear the Holy Spirit. Don't ever fear the Holy Spirit. Guess what? When you said, Jesus, I accept you, when you made that prayer, guess what came in you? The Holy Spirit came in you. There are gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's another topic for another day. But the fact that the Holy Spirit is in you, it started the moment. So you, what, what are you fearing? He's in you. Why did you stop doing that thing? I don't know. I just thought it was a good thing to do because I started going to church. No. When you said, Jesus Christ, I accept you, guess what? The Holy Spirit started making you feel, eh, I don't need that. I don't want that. That's the Holy Spirit. Oh, it feels so good when I come in here and the sound is, and, and, and the worship's on. Guess what? It's the Holy Spirit. And there are people who will come in here that, maybe have never walked into a church or haven't walked into a church like this. They haven't walked to an, into a church where the presence of God is here and they'll start, hmm, this, something feels odd. It just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right because the Holy Spirit is yet to be residing in you yet. But it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. Surrender the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 just tells you, but you will receive Power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power. You are not powerless. You are not defenseless. You are not anything that the enemy has tried to speak down on you. You are everything God has spoken about you. And he called you righteous. He called you his. How much more would you want? This is the creator of heaven and earth. I don't have to get into biology and get into the planet and all this other stuff. I don't have to get into that. I'm just saying, if there is such a thing as your Scientology and your biology, it all came from one creator. And it, you know what? You didn't make it up yourself. 
And you didn't just come about. Someone created you. God created you. Not just someone. God. So the creator of heaven says, I am all about you. I, you are mine and I am yours. That's what he says. And so that Holy Spirit, even on the second part of that verse, tells us that now it's our duty to go tell others about it. Telling people about me everywhere. The Holy Spirit will give you the power to do that. And I'm not asking you necessarily to go out there or the bullhorn. If you do, it, start with the person sitting next to you at work, with your neighbor, with your cousin, with your nephew, with your son or daughter. Ministry will always begin at home. I'll never neglect the ministry at home before I start having to minister outside. I've seen what that can do. That'll destroy. As I close with this, I tell you, you know, it's one thing that I, uh, I admired about Pastor Rudy was this. As much as ministry was big to him, his family was bigger. God was always first. That's not, but I'm talking about ministry. Whether you're on a platform of 50,000 or you're on a platform of one-on-one, -on -one, that was more important. That's why I'm saying where we're moving to, the enemy says, no, it's time to shut the doors. No, it's not going to work. No, look at that church down the road. And literally, there is a church down the road that it surprised me when I heard that they were closing. Your pastor's gone. God isn't gone. Did he not raise? I, no, I, I know he raised some people, but are you valiant enough to say, I'll take the charge? Even if it's just a transitional charge, I'll take it. Why would you announce that you're closing? I say, God, you're so good. When others announce they're closing, we announce we're moving forward. And that always brings a smile to my face. Because I would think that's exactly what it would do for those who have gone before us. It really would. And so, I invite you, if you're here, if you're watching online, and you're looking for what is relevant in your life because you're tired of all the irrelevant that's been spoken into your life or been brought into your life, I challenge you. Jesus, as cliche as, as they've made it out in the world, Jesus is still the answer. Jesus is still the answer. Jesus is still coming back. He's still real in your life. The relevant can happen today. I challenge you, if you have the opportunity, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. See, again, I always say this. I can pray for you. Or... No, I can pray with you, but I can't pray for you. I can't make things happen in your life. I can pray with you so you can see things happen in your life because that's what you want. But God is waiting to hear it from your mouth, not from Gus's mouth. Gus has his own things he needs to take care of. And trust me, I need your prayers as well. Because, But first he needs to hear from me. You can pray for me day and night, and it's not going to matter if I don't take the authority to say, God, I need you. If that's all I can say, God, I need you. That's as much as he needs to hear so long as it's coming from your mouth. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. And take five seconds to think about the things that maybe we've accepted as relevant when they were really irrelevant to our life. And 
if you'd like somebody to pray with you, you're more than welcome to come up. This altar has never been closed. Ever. It's always open for you. Don't ever think you have to ask for permission. Just come up. This is the moment. You don't have to ask for permission. Lord Jesus, I just come before you. I come before you, Father God. Your people come before you. They have a prayer before you, Father God. They have the words that will explain their situation or what they need of you. I have the words for the things that I need, Father God. Lord, remove every ounce of fear that sometimes has kept me from doing the things that I need to do, from living the way I should live, from believing what I should believe. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone here that is with me, Father God, that has struggled with what, whether it's fear or the lack or the, or, or the, the, the sickness that has tried to control them, or even the judgments that were spoken against them. In Jesus' name, I come against it. In Jesus' name, everything is made right. In Jesus' name, anything can happen. In Jesus' name, the wrong is made right today. In Jesus' name, the sick is made whole again. In Jesus' name, the lack is now provided for in Jesus name the things they laughed about me are no longer a joke in Jesus name they are for your glory in Jesus name in Jesus name Lord I believe that this church is a relevant church. It's not an irrelevant church. We believe in the relevant word of God. We believe that everything you said was righteous and true. We believe that we need your word. We need your Holy Spirit. We need these moments with you. And God, you have brought us through a year of what was tormenting, but yet your glory has shined. We've seen it, Father God. To say we haven't seen it would be a lie. This is so true, Father God. You have done and are doing your work in this house. You're doing the work in our lives. Lord, I pray right now for those who are here, those who are not here, Father God, those who are yet to come, Father God, those who we've invited, Father God, those who we've spoken to, those who we are building a relationship with so that we can share your love. I pray for those, Father God. I pray for those who will be reached this weekend, oh, Father God. Out in my own neighborhood, Father God. Lord, I pray for every person that will be speaking life into them, speaking hope into them. I pray, I pray. For every amount of provision that is needed, I declare, I declare done in Jesus' name. Lord, I believe you have greater things for us. I believe that you have greater things for us as individuals and as a church. I declare it, I believe it, and I receive it in Jesus' name. I receive it in Jesus' name. Say you receive it in Jesus' name. 